Once again, good morning, everyone. Morning. Blessed Sunday to you. So we continue with week four of our uh, master <laughs> mission with the master campaign. But before we do that, let's uh, do a quick recap. First week, we talk about master on a mission that Jesus' mission is to seek and to save the lost. At week two, we spoke about hunger for God and the gospel, reclaiming the spiritual discipline of fasting. Fasting not so much for our own breakthroughs, even though that's completely valid, but really fasting for the sake of the salvation of the lost, for the sake of submission to discipline our bodies and minds, and for seeking God. And then last week, Pastor Lee talked about union with Christ. He used the marriage analogy to highlight that we are wedded to Christ, and that means complete and total allegiance to Him alone. And then He promises God on His part never to leave us, but we must also pledge our lives fully to Him. And that our work for Christ must not be separated or divorced from our ongoing abiding relationship with Him. It's Christ's love in us and our love for Him that will translate to our love for others. And so with that, we come to today's lesson. We explore further what God's desire and plan of salvation entails. And so the scripture reading for this morning is taken from Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 to 38. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like a sheep, like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God indeed. So Pastor Lee preached from this uh, passage uh, briefly last week, emphasizing the part of Jesus' compassion for the lost. And then he spoke br briefly on the threefold ministry of teaching, preaching, and healing. So today I want to approach this same passage, but from a slightly different angle. Now many people think that the gospel message is, you know, simply getting people saved and then into heaven. I said it many times, it's true, but not adequate. If getting people into heaven was God's only objective, really we should all just be raptured the moment we believe in Christ, the moment we acknowledge Him as our Saviour. But clearly God has far grander plans as we shall see today. Certainly, of course, the gospel of salvation is an integral part of God's plan. But I want to highlight first of all that there is a legitimate place for so-called power and healing ministry in which God demonstrates the power of the gospel through healing and miracles, signs and wonders. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus proclaims the good news of the kingdom accompanied by healings and miracles. Even Apostle Paul made it a point in Romans chapter 15. By the power of signs and wonders, through the power of the Holy Spirit, so from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, I have fully proclaimed the Gospel of Christ. And so both Jesus and Paul demonstrated that the preaching of the gospel is accompanied by signs and wonders, healings and miracles. And here I want to cite a recent testimony by Pastor Jeff Yen, whom I invited to our healing service many years ago. And so he shared on his Facebook page, he was sitting down once at a hotel cafe, not in Singapore, for breakfast. And then he had a word of knowledge of this lady uh, sitting next to him, having a leg, a leg pain, a left leg pain. So he asked her about it. Apparently, he, she had this issue for months and was really worried. And so he prayed for her and all the pain left. She was surprised and then he, she asked him, what kind of therapy is this? It's amazing. And then he re replied with this, my master is in the Middle East. It's a family business. Has been around for 2,000 years. His name is Jesus. We are quite international. A different way of sharing, uh, you know, a very familiar story. To cut the long story short, the next day, he, this lady introduced her other friends uh, to him. The, the door for ministry was open. Uh, he also got to pray for her friends and they also got healed. And then just along the way, in the time of prayer, he also received a word of knowledge about one of the lady's son, five-year-old son, who has certain health issues, saw vision and stuff like that. So that's on his Facebook. I don't want to go into all the uh, details. But essentially, he just basically prayed for them, received healing. And later on, they asked, you know, should we pay you? And he said, no, no need, it's all free. And they were surprised. He expected nothing in return. Later in his own Facebook post, he says, sometimes people ask him if the people he ministered to, right, they get saved. And his response was this, after years of evangelizing in crusades and healing meetings, he recognizes that not all who prayed the sinner's prayer are genuine. 
Some are just paying lip service. Others do it out of pressure from friends or simply because of the masses. But his point is, remember, you don't reap a harvest without first sowing seeds. If nothing happens, at least for the day, he acknowledges that he made three new friends who will now be interested to come to Singapore to see what he does. But more importantly, to remember that from that day onwards, there is a God who loves them and heals them. So healing ministry opens the door for the proclamation of Christ. It allows us to preach the gospel even if it doesn't lead to immediate fruits of salvation. We mustn't be so utilitarian in our, in our approach of evangelism. Of course, the way Pastor Jeff Yen evangelizes, he has his fair share of critics. Why don't you share the gospel directly? But honestly, I ask ourselves, how many of us came to acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour immediately at the very first instance? Sure, of course, I'm sure there will be some but for the majority, I believe it will take many encounters or at least several encounters of God's love and goodness before we eventually profess faith in Him. Isn't that right? And so we mustn't be too hard, you know, that, wow, why we didn't share the gospel immediately? Remember, it's also part of sowing seeds. Everything builds up to the day of salvation. And as we know, the day of salvation is not just one day, but it's an ongoing life of learning to walk with Christ. In fact, the word safe comes from the Greek word sozo, which according to the definitive Greek-English lexicon of the New Testament, uh, what scholars call bidek, it really has a wide range of meanings. This word safe, sozo, it includes rescue from natural dangers and afflictions, saving from death, bring out safely, saving from disease, preserve in good condition to save and preserve from eternal death. So it's a wide range of meaning. It's not just salvation from the eternal fires of hell, which we, we typically think of, but I want to broaden our understanding. It includes salvation both on this side of eternity as well. That, that includes healing from diseases and ailments. I also believe this is why God has deposited into our hearts that the Friends and Heart Ministry ought to have healing dimension. God knows how much we all need healing. We're not just physical, but emotional, relational, psychological. And God wants to release streams of healing at Friends at Heart, not just for people to encounter His glory, but also that He alone will get the glory. Our world is broken in many ways. We are not just down with ailments and sicknesses. We are broken relationally and in so many ways. And so God wants to release His healing streams in every dimension. And so I pray as a church, we will declare the gospel of salvation in word, yes, but also in power. And later on, indeed, with words of compassion, but also uh, with acts of compassion, but also with acts of God's power. That is the holistic gospel, a more holistic message of the gospel we should proclaim. So this Easter bun distribution, we will be inviting people to church. We'll be giving out flyers, invite them to church as well as to Amokyo Hub to encounter God for themselves. Along the way, however, if the opportunity presents itself, we're not doing direct street E, but if the opportunity presents itself, I pray God will give us faith, stir up faith in us and compassion in us to dare to pray for those in need. It may not necessarily be just physical ailments, as I mentioned. Our world is broken in many ways, but let's have the faith to pray for those in need. And it's okay, I want to assure us that it's okay if we don't see any immediate change or healing. It's far more important to show love in concrete ways by praying directly for their needs and then, you know, to dare to trust God to step out of our boat. As I always tell the prayer ministers, how you pray is important. If not, more important than what happens as a result of your prayer. Our postures when we pray should always be one of love and humility when we pray for someone else. And I always tell this to them, it's okay if people walk away not healed. But it's not okay if they walk away not feeling love. Healing is God's responsibility. Loving is our responsibility. So we want to be loving and humble and we pray for people. That's an expression of love. It's okay if they are not healed, but they cannot walk away not feeling love. And this brings me to my next point. The gospel of salvation is only one strand of the full gospel message. The second strand is the gospel of service, especially serving the poor, the needy, and the marginalized. Yes, Jesus came to seek and save the lost. That's week 1, Luke chapter 19, verse 10. But he also said, The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. 
That's Mark chapter 10, verse 45, as well as Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. So the giving of his life as a ransom for many is the gospel of salvation. That's the first part. Jesus comes, right, to giving salvation, but he also came to serve. And that's the gospel of service to the poor and needy. At risk of oversimplifying things, signs and wonders are the glamorous parts of ministry. Who doesn't love a great testimony of healing? We all, you know, like to hear this kind of testimonies and we give glory to God for that. But there is also the unseen parts of ministry, service and works. I deliberately chose S and W, right? Signs and wonders, but now service and works to show this other street strand of the gospel message. In fact, without humble service, the testimony of miracles can often be counterproductive. We often see a great work of miracle performed maybe by a TV evangelist or some prophet, but it's all nullified because of their extravagant lifestyles. And so, as a result, people throw the baby out with the bathwater. And for me, I think to myself, what a shame. What God intends is for the gospel of salvation to be accompanied by the gospel of service. It's not either or, but both end. And so, because of the reaction of the prosperity gospel, you know, and some extravagant lifestyles, certain Christians say, oh, no more miracles. We just want to serve humbly. That's a shame. It should be both and, and not either or. But let me get back to this point of service. Perhaps it's Apostle John who puts it more starkly in his first letter. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, he says, This is how we know what love is. Christ Jesus laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions, sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. In other words, don't be NATO. No action, talk only. <laughs> Let's put into action, practical action that we truly love. So don't, for example, don't just say to the poor and needy, I will pray for you. Those are useless. <laughs> don't say, I will pray that God will supply your needs. When God has supplied your need, your pocket with money to bless straight away the poor and needy. Let's love with practical action. The same Apostle John, who alone recorded the intricate details of the Last Supper when Jesus washed the feet of his disciples, this is the same Apostle John who wrote the first John chapter 3 letter. But now I'll refer to John chapter 13. When Jesus had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes, returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for this is what I am. Now that I, your teacher and Lord, have to wash your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I've set you example that you should do as I've done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. It's a very familiar passage. I just want to contextualize it in modern terms. So years ago, I went to a Cambodian village for 11 days of mission as part of the Trekkers Young People Discipleship Program to teach the villagers, especially the children, English, but also to help with other things in the village. At the end of the trip, we felt, you know, the Lord impressed upon us. We prayed that He wanted us to wash the feet of the villagers. And so when we informed the villagers about this plan, their first response was, no, how can you, as the teacher, wash our feet? Suddenly, John chapter 13 became alive. I never understood it fully in its, you know, how it feels like until that mission trip. They simply, you know, they felt that it was not right, simply not right for teachers who are of superior status in their cultural worldview to wash their lowly and dirty feet. But we insisted. This is what God told us to do, and we insisted and we washed their feet as a practical demonstration of the humility of Christ. Even if there is no immediate salvation, I'm sure they're left with the question, who is this God that they are preaching? Why do they do this? Who is this God? Singapore, we acknowledge, is no longer a developing nation, but this attitude of service should be embodied by every Christian wherever we go. In a world enamored by glory and fame, driven by protecting self-interest, the way we humbly serve is a powerful testimony for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so, that's, those are the first two strands of the gospel, the gospel of salvation, which we are so familiar with, but now I introduce the gospel of service. But there is one more strand, which then full, uh, forms more fully the full gospel message, 
the gospel of transformation. The gospel of transformation. By transformation, I mean transformation both at the individual level, but also at the societal level. I think we can all agree that a Christian in name but lives a very hypocritical life is the worst testimony, right? Nobody will ever want to believe in someone who lives a double life, in the God of this person who lives a double life. Conversely, we have also seen many testimonies of how a transformed life brings so much glory to God. So I don't think I need to elaborate on this, that we all need to push on towards Christian perfection for individual transformation. What I want to highlight today and emphasize today is how much God also desires for the transformation of cultures and societies. And that's why God did not rapture us immediately after we came to know Him, because He has a far grander plan for our world, our society, our cultures. We are familiar with Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28. Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, the word nations in the Greek is actually ethnos, from which we get the word ethnicity, which means different people groups. Moreover, it's very unlikely that the gospel writers had our modern concept of very clear geopolitical boundaries, having to use passport to travel, nothing like that 2,000 years ago. Do you know that Singapore today, I just attended the Antioch 21 missions gathering of 200 pastors and missionaries. Singapore today has 26 unreached people groups in our nation. <laughs> 26 unreached people groups in our small, tiny island. What an opportunity to reach out. I've also heard of testimonies of you know, people who discipled their foreign domestic workers at home, brought them to the Lord, even sent them to Bible school, and then eventually when they finished their time of service, sent them back home so they became pastors to their own villages and communities. The opportunities to reach the migrant workers are endless because they are no longer overseas. They are now in our doorstep. And so we make disciples of all people groups. We have the opportunity today. In case you don't know, we do have international friendship groups in our church as well. We see how the Lord will continue to grow this ministry. And we trust that God will help us make disciples of all nations, all peoples. Secondly, and I want to highlight, we are to make disciples of all nations and not make disciples in all nations. The preposition, the two-letter preparation is important. Make disciples of all nations, not make disciples in all nations. It's important that we still have one-to-one -one discipleship, right? To make disciples one-to-one, -one, I think that is still a wonderful platform. But the scripture text today tells us that we need to broaden our focus to look at how we can shape an entire community beyond just at an individual level, but at a cultural, so social level, to disciple them in God's truth and ways. The two Old Testament people who arguably made the greatest transformation of entire communities and cities, I just give two, King Josiah and the prophet Jonah. Jonah, as many of us know, through his preaching, turned the entire wicked city of Nineveh around. They repented of evil and they turned Godward. What a great transformation. Entire city coming to know the Lord, turning Godward. As for King Josiah, he was the grandson of King Manasseh, the king of Judah. He ascended the throne at the age, very young age of eight years old after the assassination of his father. Now, if you don't know, Manasseh was one of the worst, one of the worst kings in Israel's history, in Judah's history. He led the entire nation astray in idolatry, abominable wickedness. One of the worst ever. But even though he was young, King Josiah, he turned the entire nation around, turned them Godward. Besides many social reforms, he purged the temple of all the foreign cults. He rededicated the whole worship of God, Yahweh, alone. And so these are just two people who transform an entire community, an entire nation. Even in our modern world, uh, there was a political scientist uh, who wrote, by the name of Robert Woodbury. He wrote a paper while he was still with NUS at the time, 2012 paper. He has marshaled impressive documentation showing how conversionary Protestant Christians, or so-called missionaries, right? They, in particular, they have been responsible for remarkable societal changes. And here he says, uh, 
Here are some of them. The development and spread of religious liberty, mass education, mass printing, volunteer organizations, most major colonial reforms, include, including abolishing slavery, widow burning, foot binding, foot binding, remember? <laughs> Female circumcision, marriage of prepubescent girls, so and so forth. And the codification of legal protection for non-whites in the 19th and early 20th century. And he says, wherever these Protestant missionaries would go, the following phenomena would invariably accompany them. Literacy and education. Normally through the promoting of reading of God's Word, the Bible. Mass printing and print technology in order to spread God's Word. And democracy, democracy and civil society, the result of educating all rather than just merely social elites. Another scholar, this time an atheist by the name of Jürgen Habermas, perhaps Europe's most prominent philosopher, even though he's an atheist, he, he too acknowledges the inescapable and profound debt that the modern world has to the biblical worldview. This is what he writes as an atheist, all right? Christianity has functioned for the normative self-understanding of modernity as more than just a precursor or a catalyst. Egalitarian universalism, from which sprang the ideas of freedom and social solidarity, of an autonomous conduct of life and emancipation, the individual morality of conscience, human rights and democracy, is the direct heir to the Judaic ethic of justice and the Christian ethic of love. To this day, there is no alternative to it. Many chin words. If you don't understand, the point is, both the, the Christians as well as the non-Christians testify of the impact of Christians on society. That's the point that I'm making. We are called to be salt and light of the world. Singapore is one of those countries who are great beneficiaries of the early missionaries and the biblical worldview that they brought along with them. 200 years ago, who would have thought that a small tiny island would one day be where we are today, punching far above our weight in the global scene. If not for the early missionaries establishing schools, providing education to aimless, hopeless children roaming the streets, educating both boys and girls in a very far-thinking right, move, we would never have progressed to 150 years later to the rise of independent Singapore. Of course, great credit given, must be given to our founding Prime Minister, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, his team, and certainly our pioneer generation, and even medical generation. Today, I believe our government is far ahead of us in fulfilling so-called our, you know, the Billy Graham prophecy that Singapore is the Antioch of Asia. Many times we only think of it as from a Christian point of view. But I believe our government, through our foreign policy, is living out this prophecy in ways better than the church. And I think the church to catch up. We have, our government has sent many Singaporeans and Singaporean businesses all over Asia and beyond. Our small, tiny nation is impacting our world in huge ways. Do we see what God is doing through us? Can we carry on the legacy of the forefathers that has, they have left to us? I believe we can. And right now, we have an opportunity because of our remarkable nation-building journey. Singapore is best poised to bless Timor Leste, who is at the start of the nation building journey. And that's why I shared with us, I'm so proud to say that Methodist Mission Society set up St. Paul Methodist School, seeking to educate 600 Timorese so that they too can impact their own nation and lift their country up from poverty. We have been blessed, and now we want to be a blessing to an entire nation. And here I want to give a special challenge, especially to our seniors, the pioneer generation and Merdeka generation. Many times you all say to us as pastors, oh yeah, I feel very useless, worthless, useless. I want to say it's not true. I want to challenge you with a different paradigm. You all went through the early stages of nation, early nation building, which I never went through. You have the experience, education, and the training to go to a young nation and be a blessing. They are in great need, starting from basic nutritional needs. Many Timorese children are so malnourished, they can't even concentrate in class. You think of the days you drank your milk powder. It's not milk powder. It's condensed milk with water. I didn't have to do that, right? I'm blessed. The Timorese children are doing exactly what you live through. Those, especially those who post war. The poverty. You identify with them. They don't have the infrastructure that we have in Singapore. 
all you retired nurses, educators, engineers, you have an opportunity to impart skills to this whole group, young nation. You can make a huge blessing in another nation. Maybe not in Singapore, you say, ah, yeah, Singapore don't need us. Maybe true, but not for Timor-Leste. You have an opportunity to make a difference there. And maybe some of us think to ourselves, ah, yeah, I'm not sure I can do very much. I was not even educated. All I did was to look after my family. And let me now tell you how important that is. In so many developing countries where there are absent parents, fathers and mothers both are missing. The church in Singapore is far better place. We are not perfect, of course. We are far better place to bring up an entire nation or a community of young people. Cambodia, for example, more than 50% are young. They don't have parents because, of course, you know their history. We can be parents to them. So you think to yourself, oh, yeah, I got no education. I was just a parent. Good. We need godparents <laughs> to go out there to just to love, to love unconditionally, to, to live out to them God's ways, God's truth. Even if you cannot educate them mentally, that's fine. You, you touch their hearts. Our God is a father to the fatherless. We who have been fathered by God, we brought up our children in a secure, loving environment. Even if you have no education, no skill, except the heart of a parent, you can be a godparent to transform lives. The opportunities are endless. But these are the three strands of the gospel. Jesus sends us out to proclaim the gospel. The full gospel has three interwoven strands, the gospel of salvation, the gospel of service to the poor and needy, and the gospel of transformation. The gospel is for, at three levels too, at the individual, and then the community, starting with our families, and then finally, the city, the nation. Is it mission impossible? Yeah, to some extent it is, right? Healing signs and wonders. How? <laughs> we don't have that kind of power. Service and hard work, oh, it goes against our nature. Why must I work very hard and be humble and serve? How can I transform society and culture and nation? That's a humongous, perhaps impossible task. And that's why we need to abide in Christ, the lesson from week three. Without Christ, we can never bear fruit. But with Christ, we carry the power of the resurrected Christ and the Holy Spirit. And so this mission with the Master Campaign, really it's time to end with the start of Easter season, leading us later on into Pentecost. With men, it is impossible. But with God, nothing is impossible. All things are possible. Let's return to Matthew chapter 9 before I close. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to the disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. The harvest is plentiful, both in our country Outside our country, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Sounds like mission impossible, right? But here's the thing. The original scriptures did not have chapters and verses. Matthew chapter 9 flows actually to Matthew chapter 10. Immediately after the disciples were told to pray for the harvest, they were sent out by Jesus. That's the amazing part. In other words, they became the answer to their own prayer. They prayed, Lord, send the laborers. The very next scene, they became the laborers. A seemingly impossible mission turns possible through prayer. And for the disciples, they have seen their master in action. They saw how Jesus taught, healed, and compassion, how he served and he prayed. So the practical step for all of us is as even as we discern longer term uh, plans that the Lord may give to us assignments, the short-term plan is come 1st of April when we distribute the, the buns. I pray that God will open our eyes to see that truly the harvest is plentiful. May God stir our hearts with compassion, convict us that the workers are few and we will not just do it once off, but we pray that the Lord will send us out into His harvest field consistently. Come, let us pray. Lord, you are still on a mission. Lord, we thank you that you have saved us. 
and you continue to save us. But Lord, your intention is not for us to keep this good news to ourselves, but Lord, you desire to send us out. We pray, Lord, you will raise up and send laborers into the harvest field. Open our eyes to see that the harvest is ripe and plentiful. Send us out by the power of your Holy Spirit to proclaim the three-strand gospel, the gospel of salvation through signs and wonders, the gospel of service to the poor, marginalized and needy, and the gospel of transformation, that power to transform life, individual lives, and the community. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.